I want it today just in case you've never gone out there and you've looked at the Baptist faith and message. Maybe you have for uh, the first time ever since I brought it up inside of this. But I wanted to read you this section of the, the Christian and social order. So I'm going to read it. It's kind of lengthy. Uh, and so pay attention to it because we're going to hit part of it today and then we'll hit part of it next week. And then there's like we could really like we could go on and on and on inside of this series. But listen to how it reads. It says this, all Christians are under obligation. I don't think a lot of us like the word obligation. Like we don't like to feel that we are obliged to do something, but we truly are to seek and to make the will of Christ supreme in our own lives and in human society. Means and methods used for the improvement of society and the establishment of righteousness among men can be truly and permanently helpful only when they are rooted in the regeneration of the individual by the saving grace of God in Jesus Christ. Here's where it begins to break down. In the spirit of Christ, Christians should oppose racism. Every form of greed, selfishness, and vice, and all forms of sexual immorality, including adultery, homosexuality, and pornography. We should work to provide for the orphaned, the needy, the abused, the aged, the helpless, and the sick. We should speak on behalf of the unborn and contend for the sanctity of all human life from conception to natural birth. Every Christian should seek to bring industry, government, and society as a whole under the sway of the principles of righteousness, truth, and brotherly love. In order to promote these ends, Christians should be ready to work with all men of goodwill in any good cause, always being careful to act in the spirit of love without compromising their loyalty to Christ and his truth. Man, if we could find men and women who would run for office on that ticket, I would vote for them all day, every day. Because hopefully those are things that you line up with. Hopefully those are things that you see through the scope of the cross and you go, man, I believe in those pieces. And so today as we talk through that, I'm going to ask that you stand in honor of reading the scripture, but Colossians chapter 3. If you've got your phones, you can hop in, uh, you can go to the U version of the Bible, go to the bottom and go to events, and then we are the first, probably should be the first one on there, but all the notes, even the scripture is on there. But Colossians 3, starting in verse 12, and kiddos, if you're filling in, this is where we start filling in. Um, <laughs> Colossians 3, verse 12, it actually says Acts 2.42, and that's a copy and paste on my bad. But it is literally Colossians chapter 3, my bad. It says this, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. Man, let's just stop, chosen ones. Like We just got to sing these songs of worship about being chosen by God. It doesn't mean he's leaving everybody out. It just means that in your life, man, he began to tap on your heart. He began to work on you. He began to call you. He began to say there's something different in you and jumped into a relationship with you. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. See that word must and above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let's pray. God, today, as we talk about what could be a controversial subject, man, God, I thank you that inside of your word, it's not controversial. Because of what Jesus did for us, man, we in turn, we should do that for everyone. We should care less about the color of their skin, the country, uh, or the continent on which they were born. We should just love people. Yes, there will be days, moments, and times where we disagree in philosophy. We may disagree spiritually on things, but at the end of the day, we are called to love people just like you did. And yes, there are those tough conversations that may come. And I pray that in those moments and times that you would guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus so that we could say what you would have us to say in a way that might sway them to understand what the cross was all about, to understand that there is no empty uh, there is now an empty grave, that there is a Jesus that we follow who died for us and then came back to life. Help what we would say out in public to the watching world and all of our social media. Help it to be good and pleasing and helpful and not harmful. Jesus, we love you. Come quickly. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Have a seat. Have a seat. Um, but 
The first point to make for all of us adults in the room, kiddos as well, can't be called, you can't be called God's chosen ones and disregard our social obligations of compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. And I got to be honest with you, there are a couple of those words in there, like I struggle with them at times. Patience. Ask my kids, ask my wife, driving. It's part of the reason why there's not a rap on my Jeep anymore. I'm worried about who I'm offending while I'm driving. It started to tear up anyway. As I was getting in, some of the letters were falling off. Some of you are like, I didn't see your Jeep. out. It's out there. It's just not wrapped anymore. But I struggle with some of those things. I struggle with compassion at times. said that last week. But just because we struggle with them doesn't mean that we X them off as things that we can't attain in our lives. Man, if we say that we can't be compassionate, if we can't find kindness, man, then, then there's a problem inside of us. Because Jesus, who is in you, the Holy Spirit of God who is in you, he gives you the ability to find compassion in those moments where you might want to blow up. He gives you the opportunity to be kind instead of rude. He gives you the opportunity to be humble instead of proud and arrogant. And he gives you those moments where you can be meek. You don't have to say something every time you feel like you want to. There are so many times when I look on Facebook that I just I read something and I quickly slide it up. Because I'm afraid of what I might say. Probably what I'm going to say is going to be something from Scripture, but, but that might offend somebody. And it may be that, that we need to say more things in those moments. But then uh, so often I feel like we throw things out there and then we just let everybody else devour each other. But that word patience, that's one that always comes back to me. It's hard at times. So I just want to say to you as campus pastor of Cross City North, I'm with you in the struggle to be this, but it's hard for us to be light and salt in this world if we, as God's chosen, can't find it in our hearts or if we disregard our social obligation to be this to the people that we live in and around, the people that we work with. And so as you look at that today, look at it. It says, put on then as God's chosen ones. Man, he did. In that moment that he, he tapped your heart, in that moment that you surrendered your life, he separated you out. It's a step of holiness. He, he sanctified you. He set you apart. And so as his chosen ones, as his set apart ones, then we have to work even harder in those moments to, to, to put on our holiness, to be loved to people, to be compassionate, to be kind, to be humble. Like we're going to have to work harder in those moments. His chosen ones, look back up. Uh, I didn't read these earlier, but look back up to verses 10 and 11. And have put on the new self. Like, did you realize in the moment that you became a believer, you put on your new self? God did that for you. He put on your new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. That's what we were singing about earlier, right? If there's going to be integrity in our worship, then when there are words up here on the screen and you can't sing those words and mean it, don't sing those words, right? But if we're going to sing that we are in the image of God, if we're going to sing those words that we are his chosen, if we're going to sing those things, then here's even more meaning. Here, man, as he's talking here, there is not Greek and there is not Jew. There is not circumcised or uncircumcised. There's not barbarian. Uh, barbarian. There's not uh, the Scythians. There's not slave. There's not free. But Christ is all. And he's saying don't look at these people uh, because of the color of their skin or where they came from or where they're even headed. Look at them as people who either already know Jesus or who need Jesus. And if we will look at everybody as someone who either needs him or already knows him, well, if they already know him, then they should be our friends. And we should be able to at least agree on who Jesus is. But if they don't know who Jesus is, then we've got a whole other opportunity to invest in them. And yeah, does it get hard? It does. In Jesus, race doesn't matter anymore. In Jesus, race does not matter anymore. In fact... If you look in scripture, it never did. Look in Genesis chapter 1, and we've been in and out of Genesis with this last series and this series. But Genesis chapter 1, look in verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion, one race over another. No. It's not written in there. Over the fish of the sea and over the birds and over the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27. So God created man in his white, brown, black. Doesn't have a color. 
It just says in his image, in his own image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. So every person on this planet was created in God's image, no matter what color they are. God does not look at someone and see their color. God does not look at them and see where they came from. God looks at them and sees, man, this is either his child or not. And we've got to look at people the exact same way. Got questions, uh, this, this one piece, one little line in here, but it's one race. It's the human race. It's one race. It's the human race. Looking, uh, I looked it up on gotquestions.org. I love that as a reference. Uh, teachers, you got kids who ask you tough questions at times, maybe spiritually uh, ask you something at school or whatever. Great resource. Kids at home, great resource. But look what they said in gotquestions.org. It says, the first thing to understand in this discussion is that there is only one race, the human race. Caucasians, Africans, Asians, Indians, Arabs, Jews are not different races. Rather, they are different ethnicities of the human race. All human beings have the same physical characteristics with minor uh, variations, of course. More importantly, all human beings are equally created in the image and the likeness of God. So maybe you grew up in a home and it was racist towards fill in the blank. You don't have to continue to carry that mantle. You can look at it today and look at it that you were created in the image of God and so was the person that you used to be racist towards. Some of you, you did. You grew up in a tough situation. You grew up and maybe you had family members who who were bent that way. You had family members who would say derogatory terms about fill in the blank, whatever race, whatever, uh, whatever ethnicity, whatever that was. Man, As a believer, as a chosen one, as one who understands the grace of God, you have to rise above it because you don't want that to filter into anybody else inside your family. And you want to be able to be the voice of reason for those who might still be carrying that mantle to help them to stop. Because at the end of the day, God does not look at us and and, and divide us up by race or ethnicity. Either we are his chosen ones but we're not, and we need to be. Kids, adults, uh, point number one on here, as believers, we are God's chosen people. We're God's chosen people, not because of what we did, but because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. Like we, we talked about it, like we couldn't be good enough, we couldn't have done enough good stuff, we couldn't have been uh, pro everybody on the planet enough, and that, God, that would be enough for God. God said, hey, what Jesus did for us, that's the only way by which we begin to do anything good on this planet. And talking about this to Brick the other day, I told her, I said, even like being the student pastor uh, at First Baptist Eulis all of those years, um, like I love being the student pastor there and, and loved going into Trinity High School. Because when I walked into Trinity High School, and we would go there just about every Wednesday for lunches. Like when I walked into that school, I feel like uh, inside of that school, there was just about every, I think there's 72 ethnicities that are represented inside that school. And so when I'd walk into that school, I always, it didn't smell to me what heaven I think will smell like because uh, it was a school cafeteria. But when I walked into it and I saw all of these nationalities and all of these ethnicities inside of this room, every time I walked in there, I thought, this is what heaven's going to look like someday. And for those of you who are still holding on to some of those racism thoughts of the past, those things where you don't like this group of people or this group of people, you're going to hate heaven because it will be all of eternity with all that mix of all of those people. And so, man, as you go through your day, man, you think about what you grew up with, you think about that, but then you begin to understand even more that you are God's chosen ones. You can't hold on to those things of the past anymore. Number two, the problem with forgiveness is its scope. The scope of forgiveness, look at it. It has no terms. It has no limit. It's not based on if or when. It sees Jesus did it for us even while we were still sinning. That was the verse that Michael threw up there while we were in the middle of worship. Man, it took me for a loop as I was sitting there singing, and all of a sudden there's that verse, and it's just like being reminded that in the middle of my sin, in the middle of my mess-ups, that Jesus stepped in, and he began to show me more about himself. And when he begins to show you more about himself, then guess what? Less of you is in the way. More of him, less of me. 
More of him, less of me. But while I was still sinning, while I was still in the midst of my mess, so the problem with this is its scope because Jesus, man, in the middle of that, he still chose the cross. He still chose the cross. So forgiveness for us, then, then that means we have to look past those things in, in other people's lives and love them anyway. Doesn't mean we always agree with them. There are plenty of people uh, on this planet, plenty of people on Facebook that I do not agree with. And back in the day, I remember early on in student ministry, one of the things that they were talking, telling us, you know, even in seminary, man, you're, you're going to have this whole thing about tolerance. You're going to have to, uh, we're going to have to teach all of our kids tolerance. And, and what kids think of intolerance nowadays is just saying everything's acceptable and okay. That's not the case. Tolerance is, I love you, I disagree with just about everything that you stand for, but I'm going to say it in a way that I can still put Jesus in the topic or inside that conversation. But this whole word tolerance, man, forgiveness costs Jesus everything. And so today, man, because he was willing to die for all of those sins, some of the same things that we still need to stand up and say, this is still sin, and we're going to talk some hard and heavy about some of those next week. We'll probably leave no stone unturned. So if you've got some friends who are dealing with... Some of those sexual in nature sins, bring them. Let's talk through it. But look at that word, verse 13, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, you also must forgive. Bearing. That word bearing, man, it's about caring somebody. Man, it's, it's about helping them out. It's about answering tough questions when they come your way. Man, why don't you agree with this, political, whatever this is? And it seems like so much now we have to talk about politics, right? But, but under, letting people understand what you believe about this and why. Letting people understand. And in doing that, man, you are supporting them mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, but you're helping carry the load. You're helping them understand things what, from a biblical perspective, like that really needs to be the guidebook for us. It really needs to be, how, when I go to the, to the ballot box, man, I need to look at the, the people who are running for office. And as much as possible, those people that are running for office, how do they line up with God's word? It can't just be my thought. It can't just be my, my heart. Or it can't just be uh, my best friend's thinking process on this. It really needs to figure out. I need to figure out how does that line up. And that's helping people to bear. Who is God calling you to bear with? Some of the people, like, it is a, it is a difficult, <laughs> daily, difficult thing to bear with some of the people that you work with. Maybe for some of you, maybe it's even people inside your own home. I don't know. But, but we are called to bear with or to bear out these things. Repent because uh, repent means to turn or change your mind regarding sin in Jesus. We talked about that last week. But it's also helping people to understand how you made that decision in your life. How, how you came to that understanding. Man, it was because probably somebody uh, was able to bear with you and helped you and helped answer those questions. We need to be ready to do that as well. Um, forgiving. Forgiving is about pardoning. And it's about ceasing to be resentful towards someone again. That's a difficult thing. Again, Maybe some of you, you had some things that happened to you in your past, dealing with teenagers through all of those years. Most every time it was somebody either in their home or in their family that did something to them, and they're still carrying that, that burden, helping them understand that forgiveness is the best thing that can happen, and that for, forgiveness is that first huge step uh, of repentance and, and just turning away from God. Like we all need to understand that, that there's that moment that when I understand who Jesus is and, I, and I, I hear that call in my life, that I need to turn from the way that I was going and turn to him. But then the Holy Spirit, we talked about him as well. But, man, he's the one that's filling you up individually. He's the one that's leading us, guiding us, and directing us. And all of that, his work inside of us helps us to bear with those that we might not always see eye to eye on. He continues to guide us. For the chosen one, it's not a suggestion. Look at the end of verse 13. As the Lord has forgiven you, you also must forgive. So who is it? Who is it in your life? Maybe for some of you, you need to forgive yourself. For some of you, you made a choice in your past, you made a decision, and that decision, maybe it changed kind of the course of where you were headed or whatever, and you still carry that each and every day. Ask God to help you to forgive yourself today. Maybe it was a, a grandparent or a great-grandparent or somebody that really held the torch in your life as far as uh, racism and, and, and just hating a group of people or whatever. Man, 
Forgive that grandparent, forgive that great-grandparent, and don't continue to carry that mantle anymore for them. Does that make sense? Forgiveness. There are so many people who are in our bubble and in our world today. Man, we've got to forgive them for their ignorance. We've got to forgive them for their choice to to not follow God. And and then we've got to move on and we've got to help. If we can raise the bar in in their lives, then let's do that as much as possible. We were talking about uh, something the other day, and and uh, just inside the office, uh, forgot who all was in that mix. Um, but we we're just talking about if anybody had the right to be angry towards a group of people, if anybody had a, a right or uh, kind of that righteous indignation to be angry, mad against a set of people. A uh, couple of people were talking about, well, I had this and I had this, and then Heather Snell, who was my ministry assistant, she said, "I think I can trump those." And I said, how, how in the world could you get over what you went through? Because her own brother was shot and killed by someone who was not of the same color of skin as her growing up. And so her family still deals with that on the regular, just about every year on the anniversary of when that happens. But Heather chose to forgive. Doesn't mean she forgets, right? She still struggles with that each and every day, but she chose to forgive. She chose to move on inside of that, that horrible situation. And it really was. It was one of those things that endeared Heather to us and our family because we were the student pastors there back in the day. But we, we walked through that process with her. And it's that whole bearing with one another. As the Lord has forgiven you, you also must forgive. Must. Doesn't say, hey, you need to work on it. Doesn't say, hey, give it some time. It says you must. And so maybe this week you just look at, man, if you walk around and you're mad and you're bitter at times or whatever, man, look at what is causing that to go on in your life and then begin to write down some of the things or the people in your life that you need to forgive. Because if not, I guarantee those are the things. Forgiveness is not about freeing the other person up, man. It is about freeing you from the cage or from the cell that you have been living in inside of your rage, inside of your emotion, inside of your anger, your frustration. That's what forgiveness is about. So kids, forgiving others is hard at times, but it is important in fixing the social problems around us today. Man, all of the stuff that is around us today, if your friend who makes you mad on uh, on the, uh, I don't know, playground when you go back to school, if that friend that makes you mad all the time, man, it's forgiving them. Even when you don't... uh, completely understand why I need to forgive that person, but forgiving them doesn't mean you got to hang out with them all the time, but it means you moving past the anger and the frustration. Number three, love calls all of us to humility. Love calls all of us to humility. Humility calls us to let go of the past and press on towards the future. The pain of the past still paralyzes perfect harmony. I mean, so many of us, we do. We live with these ghosts of the past and they creep in, but the call of humility says, hey, we need to let those things go. Look at it, verse 14. And above all of these, put on love, which binds everything together in what? Perfect harmony. This harmony, look, verse 15, it promises peace. Keep going on in verse 15. It promotes unity, oneness, togetherness. It personifies gratitude. It personifies, like when you live in this, har- in this beautiful harmony, then it personifies the gratitude that we have of what Jesus has done for us in our life. And then verse 16, it produces growth. And when you are able to harmonize with somebody, you're able to live uh, with this group of people, even though you don't always make, uh, they don't always make sense in their thought, their philosophy, even though you may not always understand them, when you're able to make it work, In all of the diversity, in all of the different thinking, you're still able to make it work. Man, that's Jesus inside of you, loving people. Uh, Brooks come home at times and just talked about some of the even friends that she has in different settings that I don't get to be in all the time at school or whatever. But to be able to be Jesus in those moments, wherever you work, wherever you uh, coach, if you're a coach for your kiddos' teams, like there's always going to be people inside that mix, and they're not always going to act like you want them to act, and they're not always going to say what you want them to say, and they're not always going to do what you want them to do, but how you handle them says everything about who Jesus is in you. And so today, maybe it's a great check on your social media presence, just to be dead honest. Like, are the things that you put out there, do you throw it out there and hope that people just devour themselves? 
Like there are times uh, I read some stuff out there and I'm like, oh, ooh, and then you begin to see, boom, boom, and it's like, uh, 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 uh. So when you put it out there, and is it helping people understand Jesus more? Or are you just saying it because you want to see people fight? You want to see people get mad? Think about your social media presence. Think about those things. Do they promote peace? Is there a sense of, hey, we're together? And is, is there a sense of the things that you put out there that, hey, no matter what's going on, God is still in control. No matter what's going on on this planet, God's still in it. Like that. Like that. It could all be gone. Like, I, I'm praying, God, come quickly. Like, I, I, I'm just sick and tired of how so many things in our world are going, God, hey, you come back. Whenever you're ready, I'm ready. I hope everybody's ready. He's coming back. Like, we talked about that, right? Second coming, one of those big things we should believe in, be ready for. He's coming back. So we should be ready for that. Uh, does it uh, personify gratitude of who Jesus is in your life, those things that you put out there? If it's not harmony, if it's not unity, then what is it? It's antagonism. It's disagreement, it's discord, it's disunit, it's disconnect. Like it, 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 It's not good. If it doesn't bring peace, if it doesn't promote peace, then what's it doing? Man, it's causing people maybe to live in fear. It's causing people to be angry. It's causing people to, to be mad about things. So kids, point number three on here. As part of the church, our words should flow from God's word and point people to Jesus. As part of the church, his chosen ones, our words, like they should match up, Right? Christ follower, believer in Jesus. We read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. How does Jesus handle those situations? How does Jesus talk to people? How does Jesus handle these situations? Man, we should be doing our best to mirror those things as much as possible. Number four, if, we, uh, if what you do here and now and who you do it for is anyone other than Jesus, anyone at all other than Jesus, what? It has every opportunity to offend someone. It has every opportunity to hurt someone's feelings. And it has every opportunity to be taken out of context. Man, so really, truly, like the easiest thing to do with social media is what? To put, put scripture out there. Put scripture out there. Yes, you can always put your spin on that. You can always put your interpretation, or you can always put how that has uh, influenced and affected you. But more times, I'm not telling you to stop putting stuff on social media. That's your job. That's you. You pray about it or whatever. But, but when you put something out there, and it's not pointing people to Jesus, then it's probably going to offend someone. And you just got to gotta look at it and go, do I care if this offends them? Like, do I care? Like, to me, when I put Jesus out there, when I put those things, look at Colossians 3.17. It says, and whatever you do, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Skip down to 23. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Partiality, there's none. So here's a great quote. The best thing that comes from a biblical perspective or worldview on race is that God doesn't see races and nationalities. He created one race, the human race, and here it is. He created them in his own image. God sees two types of people, and this, is, this, this fits all of us in the room, forgiven and free, or those still in sin. Like, so when you put stuff out there, will you have the opportunity to go back and to help those people understand that maybe some of the stuff that they're, uh, that they're messed up in, maybe some of the stuff that they're struggling with, maybe some of the things that they've said, that that is sin? Will you keep that door open when it swings wide the next time? Do you have the opportunity to walk through that door and to share Jesus with them? Those things matter. They really, really do. And so... Um, as you, as you think through this, the, the social media platforms, all that kind of stuff, the best thing that comes from that biblical perspective is to realize that we are all created in the image of God. Man, it, it's beautiful uh, that I say all the time, I've said it with, with Trey and Kessa, I, like, I wish that I was Tongan. Like, I just, like, they're just huge athletes. Like, and so when I was, when I was uh, the chaplain for Trinity's football team and standing on the sidelines and I'd just see some of these hard hits, I was just like, oh. I wish I was caught up like that guy. Like, like it's okay to, to, to look at groups of people and go, man, that's awesome. That's a great trait about them. But it's horrible on the flip side of that. When you look at somebody and you go, oh, but they do this. Oh, but they do that. 
Like so often, like you hear, you begin to see, even maybe in your own language at times, how things could even sound to be racist, which is that hot topic of the day. What if this world never gets to the place where they don't look at the color of someone's skin? What if this, what if this world never gets to, or, or other things that make us different, what if they never get to that place and they continue to be racist? You don't have to be. You can look at everybody and realize no matter what color their skin is, they were still created in the image of God. You may not agree with them. You may not like everything that they stand for. But is it on you to change their mind? Don't you believe God's much better at changing someone's mind and their heart? You can't save them from their sins. Jesus can. You can't make them turn away from what they're doing and turn to God. Only God can do that. So how about in those uh, prejudice moments that you just stop and pray? Use the other PR word. Instead of of hating someone because of the color of skin, stop and pray and say, God, man, help me if there's ever a door of opportunity to help lead them. You've got to make it a priority. Look at it. The definition from last week, priority being of the highest of importance or rank. And when you look at people through the lens and scope of who God is, people were of high priority, right? If not, Jesus would never have come. Jesus would never have died. And Jesus would never have come back to this place after he died. (laughs) He would have said they are lost, they are jacked up, messed up, and far away from the center of where they need to be. But he did. He did all of those things because people are a priority. All colors, all nationalities, they are a priority to God. Smart ones, not so smart ones, still a priority to God. Jesus proved all of that on the cross. Jesus proved that on the cross. He wasn't racist. The playing field at the foot of the cross, very level. Anyone, everyone, the Great Commission, he's given us all the authority to go and to help, what? Teach everyone, love everyone, baptize everyone. Another thing that I miss about student ministry, seeing seeing baptisms happen just about every Wednesday night, seeing 40, 50, 60 kids at camp, man, I miss all of those things. I want you to miss those things. I want you to miss seeing people of color inside here every week. I want you to miss those things. I want you to miss seeing one sinner repenting and turning to Jesus Christ and us being a part of that in our life. I want all of us to be so caring about all of the people that are around us and to see that Jesus is an equal opportunity offender. He's also an equal opportunity savior. Jesus, he loves people, yes, but he also stood on some very strong principles We need to continue to stand on those very strong principles all the while loving people. The cross levels the playing field. Why should church have a high priority of reconciliation? Man, when we start talking about race, reconciliation, or whatever, man, we need to play a huge role in as much as we can with all of that. Look at 2 Corinthians 5. Jesus devoted his whole life. This is what Jesus was giving, uh, willing to give up his whole life for. He was, he was willing to die for his church. But look at this, start in verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Who? The chosen ones. The ones that we started out talking about. We are ambassadors for Christ. Man, if our country's trying to do something in this country and, and we, need, uh, we need to start building something there, we need to fix something that's going on there, what are we going to do? We are going to send an ambassador to fix that, to begin to build great relationships. You're the ambassador. Wherever you work, you're the ambassador. Brooke happens to be an ambassador at Keller Central High School. You fill in the blank. Wherever it is that you wake up tomorrow morning and you go there, you're an ambassador for Christ. Continue on. It says, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal Through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God in him. It's all in him. You get to be that ambassador. You get to be an ambassador to the people that maybe you don't always agree with. Maybe they don't look like you. Maybe you don't like what they have to say. You still get to be an ambassador to them. And there may be some things that happen in their past, and they're carrying that, and they're hurting from all of that. It's not always our job to poke on that hot button. It's not always our job to put a jab in there. It's not always our job to do those things. But it is always our job to love, and it's always, always, always our job to help raise the bar in people's lives. The bar has been raised for you. It's okay 
to begin to help others in raising that bar as well. So kids, fight hard in your life to love everyone, no matter who they are. No matter what color their skin is, no matter uh, the background that they come from, no matter what, to love everyone. Make it a top priority. See, when we get to heaven, we most definitely will not care about the color of anyone's skin. So why not let's get on the right journey between here and there and stop caring about all of those things. Start loving people, loving them to Jesus, helping them in their times of need, uh, raising the, the bar for them. Um, Here's a great quote, and I put it on the kids' page too. The body of Christ includes all of the redeemed of all of the ages, believers from every, ti- uh, every tribe, every tongue, every people, and every nation. And that, that's the body of Christ. That's the church. I've gone on mission trips to Romania, uh, to Mexico, uh, to Africa, all of those different places, bunch around the globe here. But the one thing, the one thing that brought us all together was Jesus. The one thing. And you can jump from here, go to another country, and the one thing that can instantly begin to to build that bridge is love, but Jesus, and begin to tell people how Jesus, I was blown away walking from from village to village inside of Kenya, Africa, uh, and the outlying areas, I was blown away by how uh, easily people would just pull up a crate or pull up something and just to sit and to listen about who Jesus is. Jesus, he is the universal love language. He really is. And some of us, we think, man, this world, uh, people around me, they've just written Jesus off. Man, maybe it's because you don't talk about him enough. Maybe it's because we don't talk about him enough. Maybe if we bring that up in a, as a topic of conversation, that maybe people, their ears would be perked up and they, they would begin to listen. They may begin to ask you questions. So therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Are you? Just be dead honest. Like, to do an evaluation on your life. If you were being scored, uh, your, your boss or whoever had to do a, a scoring tab on you or whatever, would they look at you and go, man, they, they do. They really care about Jesus. If your kids, <laughs> if Abby and Carly were to do a check on my life, would they say, dad loves Jesus and he loves people to Jesus? Like, that's what it means to be an ambassador. Y'all can let me know later, all right? So here's the deal. Today, as you think about those things, and you, and you look inside the scope of media today, and all of the hot topics, and the things that set you off, and the things that make you the most mad, at the end of the day, you still have to look at people the way Jesus did. And what did Jesus look at them as? Harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. I mean, maybe that you get to be a shepherd to them. Maybe that they just need to hear who Jesus is through you. And it may mean that you get to throw a kind and encouraging word to them instead of trying to light their fire all the time. Man, we are called to love people like Jesus did. If we're going to claim the title chosen one, if we're going to claim the title Jesus follow, if we're going to claim the title the church, then we need to do a better job of it. We really do. We need to help those who are uh, in need of help. We need to uh, encourage those who are discouraged. We need to raise the, the bar in people's lives whatever color of skin they may have. And everybody on the planet is darker than me. Pasty, white, freckly guy. Everybody, right? Everybody. Who am I called to love? And don't, don't put any color there. Don't put anything else. Everyone. Everyone. Love them to Jesus. As we pray this morning, um, as we head out into our very crazy weeks that maybe you have and getting ready for school and all that kind of stuff with heads bowed and eyes closed. Is what we talked about today, is it really off the table for you? Man, I, I'm just going to love people. I'm going to love them to Jesus. You see, it's back on the table when we say, I'm going to love them if, or I'm going to love them when when they look like me or when they sound like me. Really, truly, aren't you glad Jesus didn't do that to you? Aren't you glad Jesus didn't look at it and say, man, until they clean themselves up, until they understand fully what the cross was all about, until they understand truly that, man, I came to save it. Like until then, no, it was while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, all of us. So if there are some people You've had a struggle in, in the days, months, years past. 
that you would say, man, God, help me in the days, months, years, future to love them like you did. Ask him today. Ask him today. Don't make that something that, that you've got to... Uh, that you've got to think so hard about it and just, just say, God, today, help me to have the right words to say to these great people so that I can point them to who you are. Aren't you so glad that God made Jesus your sin and my sin? That he was willing to lay down and die on a cross. And it wasn't based on my skin color. It wasn't based on my merit. It wasn't based on my job, my responsibilities. He just did it. Who are you going to love this week the way Jesus loved you? What are you willing to to lay down so that others can see Christ in you? Not lay down your morals, not lay down what Jesus has said in motion, not what God says in Scripture, but what are you willing to lay down of pride, of self, so that you can love people to Jesus? Whatever that is, man, let God do that in you today and see how the discussion changes. See how the narrative changes. God, today, if there's someone here who has never made that decision to love you with their whole life, to give you and to trust you uh, with their everything, I pray that today that that would be uh, their day of salvation. I pray that they would walk out these doors, that they would uh, find our crew out there ready to answer their tough questions, ready to, to say, man, I, I'm ready to join up. I want to be a part of Cross City North. Whatever it is that you're calling them to do, I pray that you would show them that their next step, it is ready and in front of them to do whatever that is. God, if there are those of us inside of this room that still struggle with looking at people through a racist scope or lens, I pray that today that that scope, that lens would be eliminated and that we would see everyone through the lens and scope of the cross. Because you look down on this world and you see people as either free, forgiven, or completely lost. Help us to love people so that they get to be part of the chosen ones, part of the, the, the forgiven and the free. Help them to, uh, to see that there is a life inside of you that is far better than anything they could have ever done on their own. God, we love you. Jesus, we trust you. And it's in your name that we pray it all. Amen.